Hey, what's up guys? Tukey here, back again with another episode of my Vegas Golden Knights franchise mode series right here on NHL 19. And today, your Golden Knights, your first place Golden Knights, continue on through their second season. We left the last episode on a bit of a cliffhanger, not really more of a, more of a decision, really. Wouldn't call it a cliffhanger at all, actually, but I'm too lazy to start this episode over again. We left this last episode with the decision to make, and that was whether or not to add to this team or not. We're at 37, 17, and 4. Again, first place in the division, but we do have the ability to strengthen this team. Five games away from deadline day, it's a question of whether or not we want to do that. I wouldn't necessarily say anybody's underperforming but when you have the assets to trade to improve your chances you have to do so right maybe maybe not uh, of course we took a look at teams like calgary and defensemen that they're shopping brody and travis hamannick we took a look at minnesota the fact that they're shopping mikhail granland and eric stahl and we do have options but after taking a look at the comments section which i mean there was support for Grandland, there was also support for Eric Stahl. Defensively, it's a bit on the fence. Regardless, from what I've seen, after taking a look around, any trade that we would do for pretty much any of these players would revolve around trading this prospect right here, Sebastian Nold. He is medium elite potential, but at 19 years old, he is a 49 overall. A former third round pick, of course. So we can make the assumption that he's never going to develop. From here, you have to decide what side of the argument you're on. That, yeah, go ahead and trade him. Who cares? Or the, well, it's kind of cheap because you know he's not going to develop, but the AIs aren't smart enough. Or the, it's kind of cheap, but you could make the argument with Fog of War that the AI hasn't scouted him well enough and should know better, but they haven't, so it's their own fault. There's numerous sides to this argument and to this debate, and as far as what side of the fence you end up on, not entirely sure. It's like a triangle-shaped fence at this point. I'm, I'm torn. I'm torn on what to do here, because, again, we have the assets to improve. And when you look to, we have Cody Glass coming up through the system, Nick Suzuki. Defensively, it's a little bit more rocky, uh, with guys like Bronstrom right now being the best that we have. But that Jet Wu signing... Has turned out to be a big one as he should be an NHLer next season. How he ended up on the free agent list again, I do not understand. And of course, looking at the current defensive situation, the top five's locked in. It's just now a matter of whether or not we want to rely on Holden and Dotchin. Holden's going to be here. This is his last year. We'll be having Jake Dotchin as the secondary option, as the depth option heading into next season. As it is, he makes way too much. It's just kind of how that panned out. It's tough, because we could bring in a Brody, a Hamannick, even a Tanev from Vancouver, but odds are we'd be letting go of them after this season anyway. Whereas if we bring in a forward, we could potentially keep them, but that would be taking up salary cap space for a potential defenseman, you know, like an elite level defenseman to be brought in, or, you know, re-signing certain players. So it's a tough spot to be in right now. Numerous uh, debates that could be had with each possible move. Of course, we brought in Artemi Panarin last year as well, so we can't overlook that in terms of a big-name free agent signing. I have to be honest. As much as... As much as I want to add to this team, I can't help but feel as though the best way to go about this is just going to be the stay of the course. Now, that could change, right? That could change depending on how these five games go. If we find ourselves in the midst of a massive losing streak here, then maybe it'll be worth changing things up. But for the moment, I'm going to continue onward. Hopefully we can hit 40 wins. If we hit 40 wins, then maybe we will just stay the course. But you look at this team. You look at how teams, of course, typically end up handling the deadline. It's about improving your odds as we beat Calgary 6-5 in overtime. It's about improving your odds. The Tampa Bay Lightning didn't have to trade as we do hit 40 wins. They didn't have to trade for Ryan McDonough and JT Miller, but you do. 
because you try to improve your odds, even if it didn't work out for them, of course. So right now, it's just that debate of do we want to improve our odds? The problem is, uh, we're on a five-game winning streak, and the argument is we end up losing to the Bruins, who went four and one in those five games. The argument is how much help do we need? Because right now, this team, for the most part, is firing on all cylinders. We have a 13-point lead on the LA Kings with the game at hand, by the way. We are in a truly phenomenal spot. It would take one hell of a collapse for us to not win the Pacific Division title this season. Artemi Panarin, our leading scorer, killing it. Happy with that. William Carlson also having a great season for the most part. 49 points in 63 games. He should get close to 60 points. I'm good with that. March or so, of course, has missed some time. It has 32 points in 40 games, which is insane. Riley Smith on the second line. He's been great. Paul Stashney has been good, not great, I'd argue. He could be better. And Thomas Tatar, mainly on the third line this season. We've bumped him up to the second line, of course. He has 38 points in 63 games. You could argue that he is that solution on the second line. Our third line, Eric Halla, 29 points this year. 27 for Cody Eakin and 32 for Alex Tuck. For a moment, I'm like, did I add the math? Did I add up the math wrong? I don't think I did. And then, of course, the fourth line, Carey, 15 points, which is great. 25 points for Ryan Carpenter, which is unreal. And Ryan Reeves, say what you want about the amount of penalties he takes, but he has contributed 10 goals. If we were to make a deal here and say it's for Granlund, of course, this would be the ideal set where Granlund's on the second line, stashing to the third, eking down, and we keep Carpenter on that right-hand side. It's, it's a tough move. It's a tough decision as far as what to do, because do you really want to mess with this team that is gelling together oh so well? I mean, again, say what you want about potential negatives in the lineup like a Ryan Reeves, but we're still winning, uh, maybe even in spite of him. Defensively, again, I can't help but think that we're just good to go. Um, I don't really feel like we're going to have a replacement. Anybody that we pick up would truly be a rental. Pretty expensive one at that. It's a tough move. It's a tough move, but we are here on deadline day, and that decision has to be made. Are we going to look to bolster this team and make it even better, or are we content with where we are? We are the fourth best team in the league, six points behind the top team in the East and in the NHL in general, the Toronto Maple Leafs. <sighs> Do we add to this team to make us that much better? I just, I genuinely don't know if it's the right idea. Do we just try to keep this team together? Do we keep the Vegas magic going? The only real change we've made is bringing in Artemi Panarin. <sighs> or do we look to move on and improve this team right now? And of course, also flip Nold while he still has value. We have to decide how we want to look at players like this where we know they're not going to flip. But if I wanted to get Granlund, it's as easy as using Sebastian Nold in that trade. Quick and easy, no problem. And I can't help but think that's the right way to go about it, but this team continues to win. This team continues to win. And the argument is, well, well you have Cody Glass coming up, so why get Granlund? While true, Glass doesn't necessarily have to be played at center, you know? My main concern here, though, is when you look at some of these contracts that are up. Hala, Eakin, Reeves, Carrier, Peary, Stashney has two years left, thankfully. We don't have the biggest contracts coming up, thankfully, but like even a Cody Eakin will probably be gone next year. Just, I mean, depending on what he's willing to sign for. I'm indecisive, which isn't a surprise to anybody who's watched this who's watched any episode of any series I've ever been involved in, right? That's not a surprise. Is Granlin still there, by the way? He should be. Yeah, he is. Last year, we added to the team with Justin Williams. And we still lost. So maybe this year we stay at the course. Because admittedly, I don't know if we're going to be able to keep Granlin. With how much money he's going to look to ask for, it's going to be very tough. Now, of course, some of those contracts, like the Eakins contract, or like Eakins contract, is coming off the books, so it wouldn't be all that more expensive. But 
My only concern, of course, is that Nold's not going to develop. We just flat out know he's not going to develop. There's no way. He's not going to make the drastic improvement that he's going to need to by the time he's even 20 to be competent at the AHL level, let alone anywhere near the NHL. Granlin this season, 36 points. Not exactly doing phenomenally well, but clearly this Minnesota team is struggling a tad bit. 29, 30, and 4. And they are looking to move on. They are looking to shed some cap. As I mentioned, the only real asset that we have that I'd be willing to give up is Nold. There's also Hovlid, who obviously I'm also concerned about whether or not he's going to develop. And we have that argument of, do we just want to view it as the AI should do their scouting a little bit better and reduce that person's trade value? There is that argument, but we're definitely going to need a goaltender for the future, and it's not going to be Hovlid. That's pretty much confirmed. So we have him to move. We have Nold, and that's pretty much it. Eklund has the outside chance. Jet Wu is not going anywhere. All right. You know... I think what we're going to look to do here, I think what we're going to look to do here, this sucks. I don't have my, I don't have my mind made up at all. I really don't. And again, unfortunately, I respect your opinion. That's why I asked for it. But as a collective, there wasn't the overwhelming, like, yes, this is the way to go kind of deal. So it makes it that much more difficult. We just won four out of five games without making a move. Let's keep the team the way it is. Reassess what we could do with Nold in terms of potentially moving him. Let's reassess this at the draft. For now, we're staying the course. Confirmed. Let's sim pass this game against Tampa. We lose six to nothing. Okay, that's that makes me feel like I made the right choice. Regardless, we need to look around the league to see what other deals went down. We're gonna stay the course. We're going to stay the course. Stamkos had a four-point game. Kevin Gravel and Lucas Sedlak to Columbus from Ottawa. Uh, Miku Koivu and Charlie Coyle went to Nashville for two first-round picks. Jesus. Kyle Wood and Freddie Clayson were flipped. Michael Roffel to Arizona. Thomas Hickey and Jamie McGinn were dealt for a first-rounder. Yikes. Uh, Minnesota sent Zucker, Roedel, and Ennis to St. Louis for a first. Cairo and two others. Good Lord. Saran Noel, Travis Hamanick. Ended up going to Florida, along with Stone and Brickley. Votnin went to Dallas. Nolan Foote to Colorado, which is just, man, some of these moves. Some of those trades. Damn, a lot of first-round picks on the move there as well. Whether or not this was the right choice, time will tell. For now, let's go through the rest of this season. Let's go to, eh, let's go all the way to April 1st. Although, nah, screw it. I hit B, it didn't register, so whatever. We'll just hit the A button and see how it goes. We do bounce back with a 7-3 victory against New Jersey and a 5-1 win against Detroit. 6-5 win over Anaheim. So we've rebounded relatively well, although we're clearly uh, struggling against Tampa and Boston. Three straight losses. That's, that's not good. A victory against Calgary. A victory against LA. Okay, so we're, uh, we're a fairly streaky team. Win quite a few. Lose a couple. Rinse and repeat. But we're still on pace right now to be looking pretty good. Swaminen's still there. It is the Lafreniere draft. Tukinen and Cole, of course, will have to be looked at as well as we continue onward. is not happy with his performance. We have rebounded, though, and won four straight. To April 1st we go. 48 wins on the season. Pretty much confirmed that we're winning the division title unless the LA Kings somehow win all of their remaining games. It's just a question of whether or not we made the right call in not adding to this team as we end up losing to L.A. Three games left this season. L.A. on 41 wins. We're good to go. There's no way that division title hasn't been locked up. Let's get that confirmation. There we go. 104 points. Uh, 11 points clear of the Sharks. So L.A. back into third. So we are in cruise control. Six and four in our last 10. 50 wins on the season. Let's wrap this up. We are making the playoffs in consecutive seasons every single year in the history of the Golden Knights we have made the playoffs now it's just whether or not we made the right call trusting the players that we already have we win four out of our last five and finish the season at 53 25 
and four. The Chicago Wolves will still be battling for a playoff spot. But there you go, 110 points on the season. Let's take a look around the league. As Actually, not every team's played 82. Not every team's played 82. We'll sim one more game, and that should solve that. Double check here. Is every other team in the Pacific good to go? They are. So out of the Pacific, only three teams have made it. Uh, of course, we win the division title. San Jose will play LA in the first round. The Sharks with that home ice advantage. And we have seen how dangerous they are with that. But 110 points. Around the league, we finished third. Tied for second with Boston and Pittsburgh. The Maple Leafs ended up winning the President's Trophy. So we were tied... Uh, for the second best record in the league, technically finishing in third, which is phenomenal, really. Tough division, though, man. The uh, the Atlantic is ridiculous. Uh, in the Central, Nashville, Winnipeg, St. Louis, Colorado, and Chicago all made it. In the Atlantic, of course, Toronto, Boston, Buffalo, Florida, and Tampa barely made it. The rest of the teams were pretty bad. And in the Metro, Pittsburgh, Columbus, and Philadelphia. Those are your playoff teams this season. We finished with a 2.89 goals for per game average, which was mid-table. Only a handful of teams finished over three. Our goals against average was one of the lower in the league at a 2.44. So a good showing from our defense and goaltending. Our power play at 18.4% would have been mid-table, but towards the bottom end. And our penalty kill... Hopefully not near the bottom. Whew. Penalty kill needs to be addressed for sure. So overall, we're looking pretty good. We'll take a look at the individual point totals as well. As Artemi Panarin led the team in points, 70 in 82 games, 61 points for Carlson. 60 is pretty much the minimum that I'll accept from a first-line talent. So for the most part, I mean, again, Panarin did well. Carlson did okay. Not great. You, you barely scraped by. Uh, Riley Smith had a really good season for a top six guy. I'll take that. Stashney, 51 points. Pretty good for a second liner. Tatar with 50, po uh, 50 points. Pretty good for a middle six guy. So the only guy I'm really upset there with would be William Carlson. Looking for a little bit more out of him. Under 20 goals. A little bit hit or miss. Jonathan March, so I mean, 45 points in 59 games. That's tremendous. Alex Tuck, say what you want, but for a middle six guy, 42 points. I'm okay with it, especially considering he played about half the season on the third line. Hollow was pretty disappointing, though. Only 35 points for him compared to the 52 that he had last year. So questions about Eric Hollow will persist as we head into the offseason where he is going to be a UFA. Cody Eakin with 35 points. Tremendous for a third-line center. Ryan Carpenter at 33 points, which is amazing for a fourth-liner. Reeves had 29 points, which is, again, amazing for a fourth-liner. Carrier with 19, that's okay. Again, the target's 20. Uh, Brandon Peary had 9 points in 23 games as a depth option, which is not terrible. So, for the most part, I mean, the top six underperformed ever so slightly, but the bottom six, I mean, they didn't underperform. They hit the mark, right? They weren't leading the league in points, though. And they didn't have to because the bottom six was able to contribute as well. Defensively, Shea Theodore, 38 points, a plus 15. Chiller with 24 points, a, or a plus 15, a plus 18 for Colin Miller. Uh, Schmidt, 16 points. So obviously, defensively, we don't have the biggest point contributors, although 18 goals for Shea Theodore is phenomenal. Jake Dodgson took 34 penalty minutes in nine games. <laughs> Goaltending, Marc-Andre Fleury, 46-17-4 with 10 shutouts and 67 appearances, a 9-27 save percentage. That is the goaltender that we need to show up in the playoffs. Malcolm Subban, not, not great. <laughs> obviously, we're hoping... Or a little bit better out of him, but hopefully, fingers crossed, we're not going to have to rely on him in the playoffs. Around the league, Patrick Kane led the way with 96 points, 95 for Kessel, 90 for McKinnon, so only three players broke the 90-point mark. Uh, but when you're looking here, no real surprising names towards the top of the list, I would say. But it just kind of goes to show how far we have to go before we get to see one of our top uh, scorers. It's uh uh, that's that's kind of my point. Like, if Bo Horvat's outscoring Artemi Panarin, I kind of have a problem with that. Just saying. Defensively, you would have seen Carlson up there, but... Yeah, anything over 50 points for a defenseman puts you into a pretty elite category. Goaltending-wise, 
Flurry led the league. I was going to assume that he did. He barely did. Uh, Matt Murray with 45 wins. So there you go, the wins leader. As far as the rookie scoring race goes, it's going to be Tolvanen's more than likely. Although Pedersen and Zadina, that was one hell of a race. And Bjorkstrand, Oscar Bjorkstrand of Colorado, also up there. One hell of a race between the top three, though, for the Calder. I imagine it will go to Tolvanen, who ended up getting the point win by a 1, 55 compared to 54 for the other two. So there is that. Overall, like I said, a strong season for us. A very strong season for us. It's just whether or not we made the right choice in trusting the current core to get the job done. You could argue as well whether or not, again, still playing Ryan Reeves is the best way to go, knowing that he's going to take penalties. Uh, but for the most part, I feel confident with them 16 and 26 19 and 31 i think Tatar will start the playoffs on that second line i mean hell you could even bump up carpenter i can't believe how well carpenter had done this season power play wise we're gonna want to address this again and i think the best thing to do uh, would be to give maybe even riley smith that chance there with theodore both lefties, which is fine. We'll set up Theodore for the 1T. And Panarin set up for the 1T on that side, too. So that works out pretty well. Actually, if we put Riley Smith up there. So 1T's on that side. Panarin, March or so on the left. It's not too bad. And if we try to have a normal setup, we can do so. So Tatar, Stashny, Tuck, Holla, and Chiller. I'd like to think that power play would do relatively well. And then penalty kill-wise, I think the big problem here, of course, is having Reeves on the penalty kill. Uh, no disrespect, but defensively, it's not too crazy. And, of course, he's not the best skater. Stashny being out of the penalty kill is okay. Uh, we could just go with Carrier and Carpenter. We could. So, it depends on who we want on these top PK lines. And, of course, I think the best thing would be use the bottom six. They hold out, and then we get our top six in there, of course, against their bottom six, uh, who would have to be out at the time. So, uh, Hall is not that great. Cody Eakin, Tuck could be on the penalty kill. Carey is not that great. I think I might give uh, Tuck PK time. So, Eakin, Tuck, Carey, and Carpenter heading into the postseason. I think that's how we'll look to do it. Carrier out there. Of course, he could play center if needed, but then again, Carpenter can as well. And then we'll put out Alex Tuck. So we'll go Eakin, Tuck, Carpenter, Carrier. Defensively, it's McNabb, Theodore, Merrill, and Schmidt. Uh, what are our pairings right now? Theodore, McNabb. So maybe go... Yeah, I guess that could work. Theodore, McNabb, Merrill, Holden. Theodore, McNabb... Put Holden out there instead of Schmidt. And we'll see what he can do. I mean, we have him on the team. We also have all lefties. We have him on the team, though. We might as well see what the hell he can do. And then that way it would be the Schmidt and Colin Miller line that would end up being out there uh, post-penalty kill, which would give us a decent little offensive threat. Perian Dotchin still has the healthy scratches. I think we're looking good. Let me know if you disagree as far as the setup for the as far as the setup goes for the team heading into the postseason, but I think we're looking pretty damn good. We know that we're playing Chicago. There it is. We will be playing the Chicago Blackhawks in the first round. Uh, players do want a meeting. I guess we'll go we'll go all out team meeting. Carpenter, what's up? Team seems to be on a roll lately. I agree. I'm going to be demanding with you, though. Note, no impact. Okay, well, I'm going to hold a team meeting and be demanding. And Malcolm Subban's the only one not happy with the demanding approach. Why? Because he's on the bench, probably. So that will not do it for this one, silly. We're going through the playoffs. We're going through the first round. We're not done here. We're not done here. I just do want to know, of course, though, whether or not you would have done anything else uh, for the special teams units. But overall, I'm feeling pretty good. Let's take a look at the Blackhawks lineups, shall we? We have a postseason matchup to go through. We lost in the first round last year against San Jose. Let's hope for something better this time out. And that paints an interesting picture. That's the top line is Thomas Vanek, Alex DeBrincat, and Chris Kunitz. Second line of Saad and injured Schmaltz. So what the hell is their lineup going to look like for this game? 
because Schmaltz isn't allowed to play. Jamel Smith is there. Jonathan Taves is hurt, too. This could be a good thing for us. Who the hell is going to be in their lineup, though, if Nick Schmaltz isn't allowed to play? Am I allowed to jump into this and look at what their line combos would be? Would it be fixed if I do this? We do have the overall advantage in every way. But am I allowed to look at their lines? Because what the hell? Like, there's no way... There's no way Schmaltz is going to be allowed to play here. He's not 100%. Uh, can I look at their team? You opponents. Aha! So there we go. That, that will be the line combo for this game. So it's going to be Saad, Debrincat, and Kane. Holy shit. Vanek and Isimov, Kunitz, Shayan, Smith, and Hayden. Uh, David Komp, Andreas Martinson, and Dylan Sakura. Defensively, it's Keith Seabrook, Aruda, and Connor Murphy. I thought it was Corey Murphy for a second. I forgot it's Connor Murphy. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. And Gustav Forsling with Nick Jensen, the goaltender, Corey Crawford, and Keith Kincaid. So Schmaltz is out. Taves is out. Manning and Gustafson are healthy scratches. They obviously have some, uh, some good pieces in their lineup, but I think it's safe to say we're the favorites in this one for a reason. And especially with those two players out hurt, this is our series to lose. We have home ice advantage. Let's get this underway. Let's see if we can hopefully make quick work of the Blackhawks, as you could argue we should, or if Corey Crawford and company are going to give us that much of a fight, which I hope they don't. First period of game one is scoreless. Nine shots to seven in our favor. Second period... Very much not scoreless. Stashney gets the opening goal of the game. Carrier makes it two, but Thomas Vanek is able to get one back on Malcolm Subban. Is Marc-Andre Fleury hurt? That is the question right now that everyone is asking. We will find out. It could be the one game injury. There's no real way to tell. We have a power play chance here early on in the third that goes to waste. We still have the one goal lead. Power play chance for Chicago. That is killed off as well. We're beyond the halfway point, and Jan Ruta scores. David Comp scores six seconds later. Oh, Malcolm, not like this. Power play chance for the Knights goes to waste. And Artemi Panarin ties it with 41 to go. Oh, my God. <laughs> what just happened? From the brink, up 2-1. to one, Stashny carry a three unanswered goals for Chicago. Vanek, Ruda, and Kampf, but with 41 seconds to go. <laughs> I'm sorry, I couldn't even react. I can't believe that just happened. Artemi Panarin is able to tie it. Three all. Let's do this. We're going to overtime here in game one on home ice. We need a victory. Let's see what we can do. Just allow me to double check certain settings. I'm going to keep it on classic because otherwise I have to switch it back uh, on the real on the real setup and such. Uh, like if I jump into a Huck game or an ASHL game or something like that. And it's a massive pain in the ass. So we'll just keep it on classic. It's all well and good. And besides, the true broadcast camera is what led Jonathan Marcheseau to get very confused and blow the game previously. So no real reason to ever use that camera again, but we don't have to talk about that. What we do have to talk about is the fact that we are here in overtime of game one. Artemi Panarin saved the day and prevented that collapse. Can we make the most of it? As Duncan Keith brings it over the blue line, Debrinkat turns it over to Braden McNabb. Jonathan Marcheseau. Can he go from zero to hero? Marcheseau drops back. Theodore the bomb and a stop. By Crawford, Theodore recovers, charges, and loses it on absolutely nothing. And here comes Patrick Kane. Carlson gives chase and is able to break it up. Kane, still around the back. Passes to the point, Seabrook for Patrick Kane. What a block by William Carlson. McNabb able to dig it out. Carlson finds Artemi Panarin. Cutting in, looking for space. Panarin drops back into the middle. No one's there. Marcheseau battles for it. Carlson finds space. Quick shots denied. Carlson still battling. Panarin will find it. McNabb back again. Here's Marcheseau. Marcheseau as the defense switches out. Chicago digs it out. Here's Panarin. Drops low. Marcheseau can't find Carlson. Panarin looking. Shoots and it deflects off a of cane. And they finally break it out. Here's the Brincat. 
Higher top line still out there for the Blackhawks. The Brincat steps into the middle. Saad, Schmidt drops back. Miller finds it. Here's Thomas Tatar. Across the blue line, Panarin still out there. He'll turn it over to Connor Murphy, who will ice it. So a great first shift there. A very tired Blackhawks team. A few of them might still have been caught out there. The big chance there for Carlson, perhaps the bigger chance earlier on for Shea Theodore that he was not able to convert. It was Kane and Seabrook there pressuring. It's Panarin, Carlson, Tatar against Saad and Isimov and Kane. So it's a mix of the lines as we're able to win the draw. Colin Miller for Smith having trouble. It'll be cleared. Here's Nate Schmidt. Colin Miller, now Thomas Tatar. Stashney across the blue line. He'll send it around and nobody gives chase. Okay. Smart move. Here's Patrick Kane. He's been out here. For every second of this overtime thus far. Kane drops back for Saad. Connor Murphy looking for space. Goes to the sideboards. Drops back for Kane. Ruda at the point has a goal in this game. Having trouble with Riley Smith who recovers it. Drops it back for Stashney who leads the charge. Riley Smith will dump it in. A battle. Murphy working against. I can't tell who that is at the moment but it's okay. It's Thomas Tatar. Fun fact. Here's Saad over the blue line. Loses it. Paula recovers. Leading the breakout. John Merrill for Paul Stashney. Back for Merrill, but Anisimov on the back check. Uh, back check intercepts. I can't speak. That's okay. Here's Merrill. Nearly own goaling it. Mark Andre Fleury with the cover. And an ineffective dump and chase so far is what we'll call it. Paula, Eakin, and Tuck against Fanik, Anisimov, and Kunitz. Can Anisimov win this offensive zone draw? He cannot. Kunitz can't get a shot off. Halla loses it to Forsling. Vanek a quick backhand on goal. Turned aside by Flurry. Alex Tuck leading the charge. Trouble. Tuck recovers. Shot. And a, ah, a big time save from Corey Crawford. Thought that was going to sneak five hole. It did not. But an offensive zone draw coming up here. Third line against third line. Sheehan. Smith and Hayden out there for the Blackhawks. Trying to avoid giving up that two-goal lead. We have already blown the two-goal lead. Can we still walk away with the W, though? Merrill having trouble. Recovers, finds Tuck. Back again. John Merrill looking for space. Finds Tuck. Eakin to the point to Holden. Merrill yet again. He'll dump it in. Around the back. It's recovered by Halla. Tuck. There's going to be a power play coming. Theodore shot. He scores! Shea Theodore with a shot from the point through traffic with the impending power play. And Shea Theodore, 18 goals on the season, and we can see why. The bomb from the point, no power play required. The Vegas Golden Knights avoid disaster in dropping game one. They did blow the two goal lead. But thankfully, the late tying goal from Artemi Panarin, the game winner for Shea Theodore. And we have a 1-0 series lead. A beauty shot from Theodore, who somehow was not involved in the three stars of the game. All right, figure that one out. I will take it, though. I will take it. Two goals and six seconds for the Blackhawks. 40-some-odd seconds away from taking the 1-0 series lead. Panarin had something to say about that. Shea Theodore gets the winner in OT, and the Vegas Golden Knights, your Vegas Golden Knights, have a one nothing series lead. The big question here, heading into Game 2, is what their lineup is going to look like, uh, and whether or not we see certain players back in the lineup. What's the status of Jonathan Taves? What's the status of, I believe it was Nick Schmaltz, the other injury, and of course, Flurry should be back. We didn't have a single note about him being out for this game. Neither man is back. Schmaltz and Taves are still out. Marc-Andre Fleury will be back between the pipes for us in game two. Everything's looking good for us at the beginning of this series, uh, following that overtime victory at least. So let's go ahead and jump into it. It is game two. Can we get the victory and take that commanding 2-0 series lead? Let's make this place a fortress, damn it. I mean, we don't have the pregame shows for nothing, which, by the way, by the way, I want a full pregame cutscene for Vegas every time. Let it be the same one. 
but I want the crazy night. I want it. First period of game two. And that's not what I expected. Not as bad as it could have been, but that's certainly not what I expected. Alex Tuck gets the opening goal just under six minutes in. Duncan Keith ties it 40 seconds later. William Carrier gives us the 2-1 lead. Chris Kunitz, about two and a half minutes later or so, ties it. And then Patrick Kane with 46 seconds to go gives Chicago the 3-2 lead. I've noticed, trust me, have you noticed yet what I'm going to point out? 18 shots to four. Yet it's three to two. Holy hell, we have no business being in this game right now. Especially to look at where the hell Duncan Keith scored from. What the hell? Two goals from the corners. Old reference here. The Rask spot really coming into play in game uh, in game two here. The first period. First period of game two, I should say. Uh, we'll see what happens here. Second period. We have tied this game. Now it's 24 shots to four. So we more than doubled our output, which is tremendous. William Carlson with the goal. It's three all. Again, 24 shots to 14. We have no business being in this game, but we are as we head into the third period. A power play chance here. Can we take advantage? We cannot. Chicago gets one of their own. That also goes to waste as we pass the halfway mark of the third period. Next goal could very well win, but with the way things have played out in the series so far, who knows as a power play goes to, uh, goes to waste for Chicago. 55 seconds to go. <sighs> Overtime again. Overtime again. Don't know if you got your fill in the first period, but guess what? We're jumping back into it. Let's do it. Game one goes to overtime. What was it, a 4-3 final? Game two goes to overtime. You're going to see another 4-3 final. Two games, two overtimes here in Vegas. We won the first one. Can we win the second. That is the question. Can we make home ice a true fortress? Can we make the most of it? Can we defend it? We're going to find out here. We win the opening draw this time. Quick work. Theodore finds Panarin. Quick move at the line. Completely ineffective, but that's okay. Theodore finds Panarin. Now he's across the line. Panarin dumps it in. Carlson gives chase. He recovers it out of the corner. Here's McNabb back down low again. Quick give and goes. Puck is loose. Carlson will recover and will be hooked by Seabrook. He throws it off the back of the net. Saad picks it up. And that could be the biggest moment of this game. Brent Seabrook will go to the box. A hooking call. An infraction against William Carlson. It's Smith and Sheehan out there against Panarin, Carlson, and Smith. And Sheehan's able to win the draw. Here's Jamel Smith quickly on the breakout. Might be able to catch Colin Miller on the back foot. Smith will dump it around. Holler recovers. Quick out for Carlson. And here come the Golden Knights. William Carlson takes a hit. Pucks loose. Here's Panarin battling forward in the corner. Carlson tries to throw it in front. Broken up by Jan Ruda. He'll find Jamel Smith back again. Ruda will send it around. Colin Miller gives chase. Puck goes all the way around and out of the zone. Connor Murphy will be offside. So 129 remaining. A decent chance. A cross crease attempt that was broken up. A one time attempt that was broken up. Panarin, Carlson, and Smith will still be out there against Denisimov and Kampf. And Chicago will walk away with it off the draw. Here's Duncan Keith over the blue line. He takes the hit. Kampf fighting through. Big save from Flurry. Second chance for Denisimov broken up. Colin Miller. Looking to find the breakout pass. Duncan Keith is there to pick it off. Here's David Kampf over the line again. Circles back. Finds Forsling. And Isimov backhand. Thrown on nets. Flurry with the glove save. But he will be forced to cover. Don't worry. We'll just now bump up a game on him. Have no fear. Huge chance there for David Kampf as he somehow fought his way through the traffic. Wasn't able to get the best shot off there though. On Flurry, Tatar, Stashny, and Tuck, the second unit out against Smith and Sheehan. Can Stashny win this draw? No, he cannot. Chicago doing very well. Keith having trouble. Tatar gets tripped. It'll be a five on three, but here's Alex Tuck over the blue line. Drops back from March or so. Tuck again. Looks to find the pass in front. 
and Keith will pick it off, but it's a five on three. He makes up for the prior mistake of taking this tripping call against Tatar. It's a five on three for the Golden Knights. Can they end it? Jamel Smith, the only forward out there. Second unit out. Stashny, can he win the draw? He can. Theodore, quick chance broken down. Stashny, a chance and a save by Crawford. Smith will clear. First big opportunity there. Shea Theodore recovers. Leads the breakout. Here's Stashny. Quick pass for Tuck. Alex Tuck drops back. Theodore, quick chance is blocked. Smith will recover and will clear. 30 seconds to go on the five on three. March or so. Quick up to Tatar. Over now for March or so again. And now here's Stashny. Stashny for Theodore. Back over. Big save from Crawford. Quickly back up to the point. March or so. Tatar over for Alex Tuck. And he's denied. Corey Crawford with a gigantic save. Robbing. Absolutely robbing him. We see the previous save, and yet again, two straight games. That's not even the most impressive replay. The second unit's still out against Shea, and can Stashny win this draw to keep the pressure up on the five on three? He cannot, as Ruda will not clear all the way down. A good set from Miller. Here's Tuck over the blue line. Drops for Hala. Quick chance. And a quick save from Crawford. Knight still putting up the pressure, though. Tatar. Back over. Hala. Miller back again. Pressure coming from out of the box. Here's Tatar. Saved by Crawford. A loose puck. Goes across the crease. Into the corner and is cleared. It's five on four. 52 seconds to go as Hala recovers. He has a little bit of trouble. He runs himself into the boards, but he gets the breakout. Here's Alex Tuck again over the blue line. Hala cuts into the middle. Shot. Rebound for Stashny. Still loose. And Crawford is there. Corey Crawford stealing this game right now. Doing everything he can to keep the Blackhawks in it. Unbelievable that Stashny wasn't able to end the game right there and then. And Crawford is able to keep it out. Anisimov and Kampf against the top unit. Seconds to go in this power play. 40 to be exact as Carlson wins the draw. Holla for Smith. Quick shot is kicked away. By Crawford, loose puck in front, Panarin, it goes wide. Sent around the back, Panarin battling for it with David Kampf, who comes out with it and leads the counterattack. And Izimov has trouble, and it's Artemi Panarin. Quick chance here for the Golden Knights. 20 seconds to go on the power play. Carlson for Miller. Smith, here's Panarin. Carlson yet again in front for Smith. No option, Seabrook breaks it up, sends it around the back. Forsling recovers, and now here's David Kampf. Five seconds to go on the power play as Corey Crawford is able to get the job done. We are even. Here's Holla. William Carlson as Chicago gets a quick change. Panarin looking. Drops back for Holla. Quick chance and a save yet again from Crawford. Smith tries to send it back to the point. There was nobody there. Here's Patrick Kane on the counter. Kane steps to the outside. Drops back to the point. It's Connor Murphy. Over for Smith and now back again. Looking for space. The quick passing of Chicago. Interception by William Carlson. Here come the Golden Knights. It's a three on two. Artemi Panarin. Quick chance. Saved by Crawford. Panarin throws it back in front. And it somehow goes through. Smith battles for it. Miller. Paula still out there on the point. He'll turn it over. And here's Patrick Kane going up against Eric Halla. Kane tries to cut in. Hall is able to break it up. He sends it up the middle. Panarin's there. Quick outlet. Here's Ryan Carpenter. Can he battle through? Carpenter cannot. Hall is able to recover. In front. Big save by Crawford yet again. Saad leads the counterattack. Up and down the ice they go. Saad on the dish from Kane. He scores. <laughs> what a move from Brandon Saad. Brandon Saad with the backhand toe drag of dreams. And Corey Crawford... And the Chicago Blackhawks will take game two in ridiculous fashion. What a sauce from Kane. And then what a finish from Brandon Saad. And Chicago takes game two. The heroics. The absolute heroics from Corey Crawford to end up 
saving the day for long enough for Kane and Saad, two of the most dangerous players on the ice at any given time, for them to do what they do. You see the three stars, no real surprise how Corey Crawford's not there. I do not know. We were able to overcome a terrible start to this game in terms of shot production. But in the end, in the end, through both games, a team has blown a lead only to go on to win in overtime. 4-3 final in each. This series heads to Chicago. Game 3 is coming up as, speaking of Chicago, the Chicago Wolves are still battling. Whether or not Taves or Schmaltz are back in the lineup, we will find out. There's no real changes to make yet. We'll pay attention to it, though, from here on out. It is time for Game 3. Let's see what happens. First period, and while Chicago gets the opening goal with Patrick Kane, again from a terrible angle, Artemi Panarin's able to tie it, and Carrier, 10 minutes later, is able to give us the lead. is having a pretty good series thus far. 13 shots, 12 in their favor, 2-1 on the board, though, for the Golden Knights. Second period, and it's the inverse. It's the inverse this time. Sakura brings it back to within one. Actually, excuse me, Sakura ties it. Uh, Riley Smith restores the lead. And then David Kampf from center ice. Because, of course, god damn it, that happens way too often. But still, we're tied at three. Heading into the third period, 27 shots to 24. And yet again, the next is going to be, oh, so important, the next goal. And it's John Hayden who gets it. Chicago has the lead back. It's 4-3 to three as we're over the halfway mark of the third period. We need a hero here. Five minutes to go. And Dylan Sakura makes it 5-3. to three. A frankly terrible game for Marc-Andre Fleury. 40 shots to 36. 5-3 final for Chicago as they take the series lead for the first time. And this is not what we were hoping for of course the first game to end in regulation in the series as we're signing goes down to injury in, uh, in the ahl we're just going to go best lines i mean that team might be heading to the playoffs so we want to give them as good of a chance as they possibly can have but i think before game four we'll look to make a lineup changes actually there you go it's confirmed chicago is just going to miss out so we'll definitely just play the best line possible and see how it goes from there let's take a look panarin i mean four points Two for Carlson, three for March or so. Okay, Thomas Tatar has been a little bit disappointing. Ever so slightly. Carrier's done well. Carpenter's done well. I really wouldn't say there's anybody that's been horribly inconsistent. Defensively, though, that top pairing, plus minus wise, has been brutal. Fortunately, everyone else has been okay. So I think we're just going to have them swap sides. Maybe that'll help them a little bit. Uh, yeah, that's the reason why we're losing. That is the reason why we are losing. Marc-Andre Fleury right now is not getting the job done. Uh, Malcolm Subban, of course, wasn't exactly getting the job done either. So it's the thing that we were pretty much the least concerned about in terms of do we add on the offensive side, do we add on the defensive side. The discussion was never there about goaltending. Chicago, keep in mind, ended the season on a 2-8 and eight stretch. But they have a 2-1 to one series lead here because Marc-Andre Fleury is not playing up to his caliber right now. And as we go into game four, this is basically a must-win game. If we lose here, we're down 3-1 to one to Chicago. And yeah, we have home ice advantage, but we didn't make the most of it by losing game two. This is an extremely important game for us. Let's see what happens. First period of game four, and Chicago takes an early lead. Two goals in 11 seconds for Patrick Kane, both from the outside. I don't know what to do because Marc-Andre Fleury can't stop a puck right now. Second period is scoreless. 26 shots to 14 in our favor. As we go to the third period, Jan Ruda makes it three. And Marc-Andre Fleury is having a nightmare series as a power play goes to waste. We have another one. That we're able to take advantage of. Shea Theodore gets the goal. So 3-1. We're back in this. If we can get two quick goals. It's happened all series long. But it's looking less and less likely. Chicago takes game four by the score of 3-1. to one. Coincidentally, that's also now the series lead that they have. As Corey Crawford 
has been playing up to his caliber somewhat. Uh, Marc-Andre Fleury absolutely has not been. And we are at risk of winning the division title, yet falling to the eighth seed. Winning the conference, not just the division title. That is beyond frustrating and extremely disappointing. We'll see what changes we can make here, but when you want to talk about what goaltending change, I mean, Flurry is our best chance to win, but goddamn, that's just not going to cut it. And Malcolm Subban didn't exactly cut it either. It's like, do we turn to Oscar Dansk? He had a pretty good season in the AHL last year and limited appearances in the NHL. He killed it. I got to be honest, it's something that I'm considering. Because, goddamn, are we just desperate right now for any form of competent goaltending, which we simply haven't had in this series. We know the Chicago Wolves aren't in the postseason. We'll go best lines down in the AHL for now. The big question is, do we go with Flurry, who's been brutal? Do we go to Subban, who in his one appearance was pretty brutal? Or do we turn to Oscar Dansk? As crazy as that is. He had a pretty good season behind a somewhat poor team in the AHL. And in the NHL last year, he was phenomenal. Not to mention what he did in the real world season. As crazy as it is, desperate times call for desperate measures. Oscar Dansk is getting the start in Game 5. What's the worst that's going to happen? What's the worst that could possibly happen? I just wanted to make sure that we were up to the day. Lineup-wise, we need to try and spark some form of change. That top pairing is not getting it done. Third pairing solid, but we need something new. Uh, we're going to go with Schmidt and Theodore. And let's go with Miller, McNabb, Merrill, and Holden. I think that's how we'll do it for now. And then top pairing... Carlson has three points in four games. Still only one point for Tatar. Alex Tuck had two points, as does Halla. It's going to be Tuck or Halla that gets the call up. Not sure who it's going to be, to be honest. And then fourth line wise, Reeves has the one point. I mean, there's only a minus one, but I think Ryan Reeves. I'm keeping Ryan Reeves in. Let's see, the one point for Egan. I mean, three goals for Carrier, too. Desperate times call for desperate measures. Right? Right. What we're going to do is... Uh, Crazy as this is, why not try it? Why not try it? Crazy as this is, and even then. Is that what I want? I think it is. I was honestly tempted to bump up Reeves to, to the second line. But that's what we're going to go with. Panarin, Carlson, March or so, Smith, Stashney, Carrier, Tatar, Hall of Tuck, Reeves, Eakin, Carpenter. Defensively, we've already seen those changes. Oscar Dansk gets the start. We are one loss away from yet again collapsing in the playoffs in extremely disappointing fashion. But we'll take it one game at a time. Let's see what we can do. Game five here in Vegas, first period. And we do get the opening goal. It's Artemi Panarin. They outshot us 11 to 8. We have the 1 0 lead. Second period, they do tie it. Patrick Kane with the goal. They're out shooting us 26 to 18. At least he got beat from the front, not from center ice or way out wide. To the third period we go. Let's see how it goes down. The next goal is also important. We have a power play that we cannot take advantage of. Eight minutes in, power play for the Hawks. That is killed off as well. Power play chance just beyond the halfway mark. That goes to waste. Neither team 
able to make the most of their chances. Are we destined for overtime? John Hayden. And the Chicago Blackhawks win this series in five games. Oscar Dansk gave us the best goaltending performance we have had all series. But Corey Crawford was just too good. Corey Crawford was just too good. And so ends another season for the Golden Knights. Where, again, the questions will remain of whether or not we should have added to this team. We won the goddamn conference. But in the end, I mean, point-wise, it was all right. Marc-Andre Fleury sank us. He's the reason we were here, and he's the reason we faltered. And that raises some serious questions heading into this next offseason and heading in to the draft. <laughs>